<laughs> shall we get rolling or uh sure yeah okay. i just got a message from doreen she said she can't find the link i sent it yesterday uh and so i forwarded mark's email can you tell her that because i'm afraid if, if i get out of this uh mm -hmm. and try to email her it might end the Zoom meeting i can do it hold on can you yeah so wait a second. yeah yeah i won't but... thank you whose suggestion was this book um <laughs> he asked smilingly <laughs> it was mine I, I i thought it was i thought it was just wonderful thank you thank you for no, picking it i mean I, it was I an easy that, read but it was certainly he, he you know he got a lot in in 80 some pages that's for well, sure well why don't you start us off because i mean the way ben normally runs things is we uh we kind of go around introduce each other uh and uh, ourselves to each other and give any comments uh opening you know impressions about uh that, that you, so why don't you start us off charles okay well um you know i i love the way he started at the end of the story we really we really got a different impression of who the man was from the end of the story than we did by watching his 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 life, so to speak, uh, unwind. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my one of the things I don't like is reading it on my iPad because mm -hmm. I can't make notes as easily. So it was, but there was something that that was. I don't know, there was a phrase in there that said, you know, his life didn't look like his life looked to others. Or, yeah, I mean, it was just, you know, what, what was going on within him was so much different than what people could see on the outside, which is, I think, probably more typical than the atypical of people. Well, that's a good start. Uh, why don't we keep going around the room? Then, then you tell us who's next, because it depends on, on your, the order of the screen that you have. Uh, okay, Ben. Well, since you're speaking, you're next. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Don't raise your hand. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm not shy. Well, I thought it was a terrific book, uh, absolutely masterly. It was clinical at times, uh, but then also it's very understated, uh, and not just because of brevity. So I think he's he's uh, dealing with with uh, deep issues, and does so in a um, in with really a light brush, which which is just amazing. So, uh, and I also think, and I don't mean to jump to the last question, but I think it has a lot to speak to us uh, in uh, in our own day. So I don't think it's it's grown old at all. Great, great, uh, David, you're next on my screen. Okay. I, yeah, I thought it was a great read. And I have to admit, I read it uh, from about 1.30 in the morning to, to uh, there until I finished. So uh, my recollection might be a little fuzzy. But <laughs> what I really sort of struck me about it was privilege. I mean, he really sort of felt like he, he uh, was entitled to a life without any sort of difficulty and the difficulties were imposed on him from everyone else, from his wife onward. And, uh, and there, the idea that you don't have anything that, that, um, that interrupts your, your jaunty personality sort of struck me, uh, particularly in, given the last four years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's right on, and it's uh, yeah. Tolstoy brings this this elevated personage uh, down to earth, literally, uh, by the end of the book. Uh, so good. So Doreen, you're next on my screen. Glad you joined. Thank you. I couldn't find the Zoom link. Thank you, Jay and Mark, for sending it again. Um, super readable. Um. Uh, funny at points in kind of a hmm, self-centered way. 
Um, I didn't completely understand the ending. I'll be honest, I'm really glad that we have a book club so that you guys can help. I didn't like find a happy ending or a sad ending. I just couldn't really understand it all that well. So I look forward to talking more about what that meant. Great, I think that's a perfect thing to do here. So, uh, Jerry? Good evening. Well, um, I found the book uh, fairly easy to read. I went right through it. Um, this is my first time meeting with y'all, so I'm mostly just going to watch and listen and uh, learn uh, how to be a good member. And so welcome to you and, and your dog. <laughs> ah, that's great. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm talking, so she wants to come up and be close. Right. Yeah. Hi, uh, Miriam, you Hi. are the, Hi, everyone. the, uh, the hello, next. Hello from Chile, New Hampshire. I've got lots of layers on. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I, of course, this is, I've read this, uh, The Death of Ivan Ilyich, uh, many times, and I was surprised to see that the ending really is happy because when I was remembering the book <laughs> I picked it up again, I thought, oh, this bleak, difficult uh, life and death of Ivan Ilyich in which uh, Lev Tolstoy really puts him through this terrible, terrible trial. But I had forgotten how uh, redemptive the ending is. And it's so Russian, it's so Dostoevsky, and uh, he learns through suffering, and this is to speak to Doreen's question about the ending. The ending is he forgets about himself and he loves. He loves his son. Uh, he, he's at the point of asking for forgiveness, and then death is defeated. I mean, Tolstoy writes, there is no death. And I, I thought it was a breathtaking ending. Uh, but I also had to feel, oh, God, this is so Russian. Look what he had to go through before he could get to this point. Uh, his wife convinces him to take communion. You know, Tolstoy, uh, as he got older, became radically Christian. And uh, he was in touch with the very young Gandhi, and he espoused uh, nonviolence, uh, but his change, you know, certainly caused his wife a lot of grief. But that's aside from what goes on in in even Ivan Ilyich. To to become a devil's advocate in a way, I thought that the that Tolstoy, coming from this very radical view, um, kind of gave it to everybody who was on his enemies list. Do you know what I mean? It's like you couldn't decorate your house without getting cancer because you fall off the ladder. And I thought that, oh, you know, maybe couldn't you just have him get ill rather than pointing out his nouveau riche decorating got him into this trouble in the first place? Uh, I know it's kind of a sin to criticize Tolstoy, but I thought he, uh, I thought he went a little bit too far in in, in that respect. But um, I also thought, oh, how terrible to be on your deathbed and to ask oneself, has my life been a complete lie? Mm -hmm. And what Tolstoy says is, yes, Ivan realizes that his life has been a lie. One last point, there's so much to talk about here. Tolstoy is so smart. He, he points out that in his legal capacity, Ivan Ilyich separates the human from the official and the judicious, that when he's operating by rules and law, that's one thing, and he decides not to bring anything personal in it. Well, of course, for Tolstoy, this is a sin this kind of bureaucratic, legalistic mind who only looks at the rules. And of course, his other big sin is that he wants a pleasant life. <laughs> God forbid, you know. Anyway, I could talk and talk about this book, you know, 
or novella, whatever you want to call it. But yeah, it's, for a short it's, book. It's late Tolstoy. It's late Tolstoy. It's very radical. Yes. For a short book, it, it, it does pack a lot to discuss. Uh, so, uh, Jay? Well, okay. This one sort of led me on a journey. I, I went from Tchaikovsky to my grandmother. Um, my grandmother, who was Russian, and um, I couldn't help but to remember every time that she used to sing to me as a child. Uh, I didn't know it at the time. Uh, until I took my music course, but she uh, she always sang in 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 D minor, um, as opposed to in major, and that somewhat to me personifies Russia to a degree. It, it's uh, certainly within a Western society, and in minor, in Eastern society, I, I found out necessarily is not something that's sad. Uh, in fact, in, in the Japanese wedding song turns out is in minor as opposed to major. But uh, Russia often is a sad, sad place. And, and I think that that certainly is manifested in the book. Um, I also think the book is, is after doing some research on, on um, Tolstoy himself, and, and some of this is mentioned, is autobiographical in a lot of different ways. Um, Tolstoy had a very bad, in spite of having had 11 children, I guess, he had a very bad marriage, uh, a very conflictive marriage, and that somewhat is reflected, I think, maybe in the book. Um, it's um, very important. He, as, he, I just want to add, his marriage in the early days was incredibly happy. It's when he became radical at, near the end and um, wanted to give away his possessions and all that, that, that the marriage turned bad. But in the beginning, it was deliriously happy. I think you're right at the beginning, but I think, I think it changed sooner than at the very end because um, he went through a period where he not only wanted to give away a lot of the land and everything, but he, he very much joined the peasant movement. He started peasant schools. Um, he was he wanted to reject the royalties on on his writings. And yeah, that all caused conflict. Um, he, he also became very much of a, a, a Georgianist or Georgist. Um, and I was reading about Henry George and what his feelings were. Um, and then also, to not go on and on, I, I guess, um, went into the confession which he wrote, which is kind of a parallel book to this, uh, and, and probably becomes somewhat important in the way that it ends and his conversion to more, a more radical Christianism. Um, and then um, sort of ending up with one thing which is, um, Blessed are those that mourn, mm -hmm. um, which came out of the eight uh, Beatitudes. And um, they seem to manifest themselves quite often within the book itself. So I, I agree. It, it, it has an awful lot of things in it. And um, I guess you can make of them what you want. But it, it certainly leads you in a lot of different directions at the same time. Jay, hey, can I just say? Uh, uh, uh express my ignorance. Who is Henry George? You made a, a reference to Henry George and that Tolstoy was being Georgian. Was that the single tax guy? Henry, Henry George was an American. Um, and he started a movement, a single tax movement, uh, which he felt was the social, the solution to social and ecological problems based on um, birthright and public uh, finance. And um, Tolstoy became a, a great follower of his in his later life, which, which goes into part of what Miriam was talking about. Of he, he was born into considerable wealth and felt that that, that wasn't quite right. And um, he, uh, even, even in the book, the, the noblest person perhaps in the book 
is is the gentleman who helped him arrange his legs during his time of suffering, who, hap who happened to have been a serf. Yeah. Um, so um, this this all kind of finds its way into the book in, in one subtle way or another. You know, Kit, uh, I, I sometimes I sometimes tr can you hear me? I'm not sure I'm being <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I'm I'm not sure. Yeah, this is Charles. Uh, you know, I really try, and it's I try to read something as if I didn't know who wrote it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you say Tolstoy, War and you know War and Peace, and I never read it, but I know I know War and Peace, and I know some things about Tolstoy's life. But if you start reading too much into a person's life into the book. I think you rob yourself of the piece of literature. I think it has to live by itself. I, I don't know what, what the uh, literary critics call that, if it's deconstruction or whatever, but uh, I'm not really that interested in Tolstoy as a person. I, I really just want to read what he has, what he has to write. Because um, I may not like him as a person, but I may love his work. Yes, yeah, sure, I agree. And I, I, I think that's fair enough, Charles. And I, in general, we, we've looked at the book first, and then we get to the person later in the discussion to sort of add some depth as appropriate. But well, not, by the way, but, but, by the way, day, but I, I appreciate that, your references. No, but when I say that, I have to fight my inclination. Because the first thing I wanted to say was, oh, in the 60s, the single tax was still around, and people were going around selling the books because I bought one. And then the guy came and it was an organization. Da, 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 da. But then I said to myself, what does that have to do with the book that I'm reading? But, you know, it's it's kind of like uh, uh, you get on the Internet and you hit one thing and then you go to something else and go to something else. I find it all interesting. There was one line I, I'd like to throw in and see if this evokes what it did for me. Ivan Illich's life had been most simple and most ordinary and therefore most terrible. <laughs> I'm wondering what that means to people. I, I can't quite, I can't quite wrap my head around it. There are a lot of places, there are a lot of places in the story where uh, Tolstoy points out that whatever Ivan Ilyich does is just like what everybody else is doing. In other words, there's nothing original. His, his drawing room looks like everybody else's. The way he conducts himself at, at work is like everybody, what everybody else is doing. And that seems to be a kind of fatal, awful thing. There's no freshness, no originality. And I think I would connect that to the sentence that you just quoted, which is very chilling. Yeah. Uh, very ch uh, chilling. I would say it just slightly differently, and to put it in sort of modern parlance, it's the 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 curse of the unexamined life. Yeah, good. The curse of the unexamined life. I mean, he really doesn't think much about what, whether he's doing the right thing or the wrong. He wants everything to be nice. So I want to um, get to James here, but I I would say I I think a lot of times the um, the commentaries like that are. Uh, reflecting the psychology of of Ivan, so it's there. It's stated sometimes with some irony. Mm. He, he's saying something in the way that Ivan might view it, which he is loading it up as as something that is uh, sometimes a straw man to be knocked down. But um, let's uh, let's get to James, and then we'll we'll start uh, moving chronologically through the book. And and we'll have a lot more discussion on this. Don't forget, don't forget me. Yes, yeah. he means Robert. It, <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, James is. Uh, that's my that's my my husband. He, hi, Robert. Yeah. He was, hi, hi, Mary. I'm just, you know, too literal uh, sometimes. I'm literally reading. Oh no, no, it's fine. I think that's how we do it. And our new, uh, just to just to clarify, our new member uh, Jerry. Uh, his his sign on says Gene, so just not to confuse you. We have two right. people whose names are different from what their their Zoom name is. Yes, fortunately that fell within my three minute memory of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
but Robert, you fell yeah. falling off. My short-term memory failed. That's all right. That's all right. Mine does all the time. Uh, I have one comment to make. The very off the. I thought this was so immensely readable, and I don't know if it's the translation, or it was just. It was so fresh, and um, I mean, I, I think about there are a variety of translations available. Mine was I read this one, which is from a collection of stories, and um, I know there's a, I, I saw online when I was buying it there were several more. So I don't know if I should credit the mm -hmm. all that beautiful um, the translation for everything, but um, I also found something very unusual. Uh, in reading it, it was this, what seemed to me to be a shifting um, point of view. Like it was, it sounded first person in some cases. And, and then other times it was third person, but it was always third person. It was Ray Portage really. There wasn't anybody actually, except when they're quoted, but there, there were things that people said that were, um, it just seemed to me, uh, to be more, much more the voice of Tolstoy mm -hmm. than, than them. And, and also what also struck me is the um, kind of ironic, um, the, the way he describes in, uh, periods in, in Avant's life. And he says at one point, um, and this is what really, I, I was like, what? <laughs> he says, um, so things continued for another seven years. His eldest daughter was already 16. Another child had died and only one son was left. I mean, it's like, by the way, and, and then of course he, he lost the two earlier. And they're, they're always referred to just as a, as a sort of a side. And it makes you, it reflects on what he talks about, what he decided when he figured out that marriage wasn't all it was chalked up to be, that he was going to keep all these things separate. And um, he obviously, the more time he was married, the less time he spent at home. So, and probably not with these children. And it wasn't until the end of his life that he shows any real interest in any one of his children. So, um, I don't know. It was... I have one question I want to ask everybody. What is an undress uniform? He talks about getting into his undress uniform. And I could not figure out what that meant. Maybe it was an informal. Informal and maybe not with all the medals and decorations on it, I think. Oh, okay. I think. Yeah, you're probably right. Undress. Is there anybody, is there anybody on here who's been in the Russian army? No. Not yet. <laughs> My grandfather escaped it. Mine did too. <laughs> 1905 or six. Yeah. There was Ivan though. So I think uh, you're right. There's a lot that's unsaid in this. And then the, the point of view is very interesting. I'll just give a very brief uh, entree and then get us into some of these other questions. Um, for me, uh, I also was uh, this was my first time reading Tolstoy. I've read Dostoevsky, and I was expecting something very, very weighty. And when I read that first chapter, I was just kind of blown away by how, um, how, you know, we used the, you used the word fresh. It's very fresh. It was very funny. It was very, uh, to me, the thing that jumps out is this is a this is a master of psychology. And all throughout the book, I'm just constantly amazed at the depth of psychological insight um, that comes through. And it's, and it's painted in words. It's never really said. It's just kind of left out there through the, the juxtaposition of what's said and the person saying it and what's going on. And uh, so, and I think that kind of comes to the, the front of the book in the first chapter. So I'm gonna combine my first two questions, which are really about the, they're both about the first chapter. And then let, let's talk about the first chapter and then we'll move through some of the other things too. Um, so my first, my questions reading through it as a novice to Tolstoy were, um, 
you know, what do you think about this balancing of the comic? And then these, and then there's some real weighty moments as well, uh, hints at the deeper real subject uh, in the first chapter. Um, that mixed tone and uh, how it eases the reader into this difficult topic. So I, I thought it would be fun for people to point out any lines that they wanted to. Uh, but at the same time, I, I'll go ahead and open the second question and we can kind of knock them both out at the same time, which is uh, that since this opening chapter is the end of the story, how do our perceptions change uh, if we look at it after I've been, uh, you know, having read the whole story. So we're looking at it through this judge's viewpoint, which adds a real comic layer to the whole thing. Uh, we're looking at the funeral, we're looking at Ivan's career, we're looking at the family all through this, the eyes of this person who, whose first thoughts are to his own benefit from the death and whose last thoughts are to how quickly he can get away to the bridge game. So, um, so I'm gonna let others comment on this first chapter and uh, see what we got. Well, th thanks, Mark. Your your questions. I think you 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 put together some of the best questions, and it's it's very hard to to uh, come up to your level on on uh, their their depth and seriousness. I li I like particularly the first question because I think, in my view, if you think of it, how many books have we all read about death? I maybe Faulkner's as I lay dying. You know, I'm I'm pressed to think, and as uh, uh, human beings, I think we avoid this subject like the plague. And Ooh. so, so uh, this was a, a very good ploy on Tolstoy's part because the comicness then breaks the denial, both the reader. And then of course the whole book is breaking the denial of, of uh, uh, Ivan's denial, if you will. Uh, and so we, we get to, to have our little denial broken up right up front uh, in order to draw us in to the serious side. So, so I thought it was brilliant. And in terms of, of how, you know, and I went back and read the first chapter again, as you suggested, and it really, it has a nice reverberation. I kind of like that, uh, how, how uh, you go back and then you see not only the hypocrisy outed, but you're, you, I, I think, um, I don't know. I know it, 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 it takes it from comedy and, and a real heaviness to then the the lightness of his transformation at the end. So, so I, I really appreciated it. You know, um, what I what I really appreciated in the first chapter was how honest it was. Uh, you know, you you read the obituaries, or you get a call that so-and-so died and you want to feel more than maybe you feel lots of times because it's a human being you knew him and such like that but he just he just hits right on the head the way we had we as a defense human beings deal with death you know there there was a poem uh, that Auden wrote about Yates and, and it's basically said that you know, it'll impact the few hundred people who knew him or whatever it was. And when you think about it, the world just keeps on going when you're dead. So the, the, overwhelming, the overwhelming reaction that people generally have is, well, thank God it's not me. And what's on my schedule the day of the funeral? And do I really have to go to the uh, burial? You know, and if you're, if you're Jewish, do I have to go to a shiva in addition? or awake or whatever it is. And uh, I found the most interesting thing about that first chapter was how, how people reacted to his death. Yeah, and especially uh, looking for uh, some professional advancement. This, this little cube was taken <laughs> off of the Chinese puzzle and now everybody's trying to maneuver themselves into a better position. Yes, exactly, and, exactly. Yeah, and that's not even a second thought to anybody. It's their first. Oh. <laughs> I was very interested. Well, I'm interested in the in the first chapter for a number of reasons. First of all, it's brilliant in terms of narrative structure, because what he does is uh, he he approaches it uh, 
after the fact, Ivan is dead and he has all the friends talking about it. And it's a very, very good way of give, also of, of giving us the so, uh, social milieu uh, of this group. So on the one hand, uh, narratively, it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, strategy. Secondly, for these, this group of people, the death is a social, and the funeral, it's a social event. And Yvonne's death is not important, really. Mm. And it makes a wonderful contrast with what happens when we really see it from Yvonne's point of view and we get a, a, a description of his, the terrible suffering that he's going through. So that contrast is so apparent. I love the point where I forget which one of them is, has to enter the room and he didn't know whether he, sh what should he do? And he says, it's always safe to make the sign of the cross. Right, right. <laughs> and he kept yeah. doing it. Right, <laughs> exactly, and he kept doing it. And they're all thinking, how can we get out of this and you know, go and play our bridge game and what can we do? So that that's also works very, very well. And on, on, in some ways, funerals and, and wakes and shivers, they're, they're social events. Yeah. And, and that, that, Tolstoy that, that, grasps yeah. that and set, sets up this marvelous contrast. That, that was Pyotr uh, Ivanovich, and that was actually once something I wanted to read as the comedy. Yeah. He began to feel somewhat uncomfortable, and so he crossed himself hurriedly. All right. hurriedly he held from the standpoint of propriety, turned and headed for the door. And I think Tolstoy is also setting up uh, 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 the the not just the hypocrisy, but the emptiness of ritualistic religion. Uh, and so it's just a lot of superficiality going on. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and he treats it, uh, uh, you know, and, and we know that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get into it maybe later, but that there's a spiritual crisis for Ivan. And I think we all know that Tolstoy had a spiritual crisis as well. And so he, he's setting this up quite early as, as one of the problems, perhaps, that, that Yvonne will have to overcome. Right, and it's so skillful because he introduces Jerasim, the, the, the peasant, who, who is so important in the story. And he says at one point, well, it comes to us all. There's also a disquieting note. At one point, there's this, this, this odor of a decaying body. So, but only that's just a quick mention and that's it. Mm. But it's all set up. We, we meet Jerasim, who is so important in the story uh, and we get the odor of death at the same time. Yeah, in fact, what he says is it's God's will. Yes. We shall all come to it someday. Yeah, yeah. Do you it's, think that- Go ahead, Charlie. Do you think that you should be that harsh on people calling it hypocrisy, it's human nature. Uh, uh, what are people supposed to do? And as far as the emptiness of religion, at least it gives a home to doing something. Are they supposed to ignore the whole thing? Uh, when, when uh, I mean, whether the widow or not had any deep feelings, assuming, uh, assuming it was a different situation and that she had deep feelings, I don't think she would see it as uh, hypocritical. I think she would see it as, as a social courtesy, which is not the worst thing in the world. I mean, uh, uh, it'd be better than if it was ignored completely. Mm. Well, but the ritual is, is, a, is a form of denial, I think is my point. So they're not actually dealing with his actual death uh, or you know, what happened to him. It's only ritual, it's all superficial. And the, the, the whole point is, if they if they looked at the body and said and felt a terrible pang and said, "This could happen to me," that's different. Then there's this connection, but they don't do that. So back to what Ben said about the examined life. Well, if you go to an event like that, you're not terribly close to the person who's died. If your your mind is working and you're thinking about yourself and have some sort of awareness, uh, that's different, I think. But, but how sad, because the, these two guys were judges were his closest friends. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think maybe it changes as you get older, but um, 
I, because I lived in New York during the major AIDS crisis, I've been to a lot of funerals. Yeah. Um, and many of them were closed ca casket, but um, mm -hmm. I, I would go and think more about the person that had died and think mm -hmm. about how they affected me and, and the mm -hmm. shared experiences we had. And in, in that context, everybody was projecting death upon themselves. It was it was basically in the in the cards. But you know, when you when you go and see someone who you have known and loved perhaps, and then and you just I continue to think, and I still do, and I think of people who have passed, I don't think about my own mortality as much as I, I I'm sort of pleasured by the memories. Mm -hmm. Um, I just heard Paul McCartney um, on the radio this evening talking about um, his new album and and uh, he was talking about John Lennon and the 40th anniversary of his murder. And he just said, oh, you know, John was so such a wonderful person. He said, I, I really just think about him every day. And I think about the, the times that we hitchhiked to Paris and the times that we, and then he brought, then he, you know, he, he just kept going. And I thought that's that's the way it should be. That's how people's lives continue, you know, and percolate through the world is through memory. And I don't know, I, I just don't necessarily feel that the encounter with the dead um, necessarily is, is, um, is speaking to your own mortality. Of course it is, but it doesn't have to be the major major point. Well, so in in uh, in this chapter, um, the the uh, Peter uh, is uh, is is the closest one to come to actually feeling something at one point. I mean, he's he looks to another friend for comfort and and is happy to see this is someone who would not surrender to any depressing influences. Uh, <laughs> And in fact, there was no reason to suppose that this incident would hinder their spending the evening agreeably. But then on the next page, after he's heard about uh, the ending, the actual ending of his friend, uh, after he sits comically on the poof, uh, which is yeah. hilarious. <laughs> Such a Love that. business of sitting there, you know, uh, awkwardly on this little poof talking to the widow, but hearing about the last moments, all of a sudden he gets struck with uh, this horror. Yeah. Uh, and this, uh, and he th this suddenly felt afraid for himself. Right. Uh, when he looked into it for a brief moment, he faced it and it was just like, couldn't, you know, it was like too much to absorb. Uh, and so, I think there is both of those things. There, there is that. There is that tension going on in this chapter, and we're getting a little bit of a glimpse. But I think you're right. Uh, whoever had said that it was about denial uh, and kind of getting through that denial um, is definitely going on in this chapter. Were there any other thoughts well, about the first I chapter? Just, I was just going to say the wife's. Uh, reporting about all the specifics of the last days, the real effect that she wanted out of that was to elicit pity and some movement of help from Peter to get her more money. Mm -hmm. and, that, and she was so, it was so clear that that was her whole motivation. And then, of course, what happens is it totally misses the mark. And all that happens is he gets terrified about his own mortality. Yeah, I thought it was really very ironic. Well, what think... struck me most about this was in the first chapter, what the, they seem to be concerned is the death, and it really is true how death changes the pecking order. Besides right. considerations as to the possible transfers and promotions likely to result, I mean, and from there, uh, there's this sense of denial. Oh no, this could be me, but it's not me. He's dead. I'm, I'm still alive. Is um, what does this mean for me? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. And 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 it's so beautifully done by Tolstoy at that moment, where it's you know, my wife would be very glad. Uh, she won't be able to. I never do anything for her relation. Uh, 
And then he says out loud, it's very sad. So, you know, it is, it does seem, Tolstoy sets it up as, as quite hypocritical in appearance, but uh, it's very human what's going on. What about the thought, uh, how does the religious get positioned here? Because, uh, you know, the, uh, there, I think he calls the, uh, the, the, where was the bit about, uh, well, he talks about the, uh, the service was candles, groans, incense, tears, and sobs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and then the man who would not be uh, the, the church reader who uh, read something in a loud voice with an expression that precluded any contradiction. So it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of, uh, we're seeing the religious through these, through this kind of uh, really jaded eyes. Yeah. Well, yeah. the religious figure um, also runs parallel to the figure of, uh, of the man, the dying man himself, because he's so pos- possessed of the image that he wants to portray. And he wants to be upstanding, behaving with dignity, reserved, punctilious, amusing in society. All these these goals that he wanted, but they were they were just so overbearing. I mean, that was all he was concerned about, and all that the preacher was concerned about was making sure that he got his loud message out and that there was no doubting it. And the same thing with the doctors. The doctors were the thing that really opened his eyes to how it's the same deal with the doctors as it is with the judges. They just, they, they see a, a guilty person in front of them and they, they just deliver the law by boom, 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 the way it's supposed to be written and the way it's supposed to be done. And the doctor says very much the same thing. Well, I say this, this is the way it goes and this is what you do. Um, just it kind of like a, a world with no um, subtlety. It, it was mentioned by, well, by, by let, several before that there was a radical Christianism in, in Tolstoy. And, and I'm not sure I, I read it that way. It, the, the, the little book that I have or a novella uh, came with a short bio and mentioned, uh, and I, I really haven't read much about Tolstoy in a long while, so I hadn't, I'd forgotten this. But he, he formulated for himself a new Christian ideal, the central creed of which involved non-resistance to evil. Uh, and... Uh, of the need for that uh, and of the moral perfectibility of man. So, so I don't know if I, I did read that he uh, eventually um, tried to enact in his life or, or walk in the steps of Christ and he gave up everything. And that's when he left his, his huge estate and, and, and uh, started doing a lot of crazy things. Uh, but I, I, would, I, I don't know if it's radical Christianism as to like he, he made his own personal Christianity up. But, but that was in a reaction to Russian, Russian Orthodox. So, so I don't know mu- that much about Russian Orthodox, but the little that the, the, the book, it seems like a lot of smoke, incense, and, and ritualism, uh, empty of content almost. And the same, it, you know, we don't get into the characters uh, as you do about the legal and the doctors, but I can imagine that the priest would have been depicted similarly. Mm-hmm. I, I, I kind of wonder, I mean, we're seeing this the religious figures here through through this lens of, uh, you know, of this comic character, the judge. And so I don't know what I, that I can tell what Tolstoy thinks of the formal religion um, fully, because, uh, you know, he certainly, by the end of this, has a great deep respect for spirituality um but uh why don't we kind of shift gears now and into his life and a lot of the early chapters uh after this one are taking us through his uh privileged life as was pointed out and uh and there's so many great phrases uh about this uh elite life uh so you know, how I loved the, it was done with clean hands and clean linen with French phrases and above all among people of the best society and consequently with the approval of people of rank. So 
if uh, it, how does uh, this career, early career, uh, serve as a commentary on Russian society? And I don't know if we need to know about Tolstoy's, you know, radical positions, his pacifist and anarchist kind of positions, because it it's already exudes uh, a kind of uh, privilege and sets that against other things. What do people think about? This, this is really yeah. chilling. I mean, here here is Tolstoy's uh, indictment. But now as an examining magistrate, Ivan Ilyich felt that everyone without exception, even the most important and self-satisfied was in his power. And that he need only write a few words on a sheet of paper with a certain heading and that this or that important self-satisfied person would be brought before him in the role of an accused per person or a witness. So here's Tolstoy's indictment in, in a way of, of, uh, of, of this type of power. He says he never abused this power, but he was very, very conscious of having it. And, um, and then again, he takes in his work, itself, especially in his, his, in his examinations, he very soon acquired a method of eliminating all considerations irrelevant to the legal aspect of the case and reducing even the most complicated cases to a form in which it would be presented on paper only in its externals, completely excluding his personal opinion of the matter. Can't be accused of being a humanist. Yeah. Well, well, you know, uh, I don't know technically about uh, Russian jurisprudence, and but I practiced law for a long time, and uh, the law, at least in Western society, at least in the common law British society, and and you know its children, the United States, has has a certain element of what's called the equity, and it's supposed to come in and but but what struck me more than even that was how when he got this robe so to speak and he was sick here was mm -hmm. a man that wanted to be in control he loved being in control and a judge a judge is in control i mean there's somebody who's practiced law for close to half a century when a judge walks in the room you stand up when a judge tells mm -hmm. you to do something you do it you know, or else they, you know, you better bring your toothbrush because they're going to hold you in contempt. Never had that happen. But here's a guy who is in control. He's very dignified. And he basically lost control of his body. Yeah. And I, I think, I think how contemporary that is right now, you know, uh, when, when, uh, you know, when you spoke about the, the AIDS, uh, the, the AIDS, epidemic i you know i i didn't lose as many friends but i lost friends and i remember i remember seeing you know how people who were dignified and beautiful and you know strong uh they deteriorated and they lost all control and now we're living through a pandemic and isn't that what we are all afraid of is you know it's not a quick easy death you know i mean uh you know, you walk and you could lose control. And not only do you lose control with this pandemic, you lose all contact with the people who you care about. Yeah. So this is so timely. I thought the story, I mean, I, I found that, you know, I missed most of the humor in it. Uh, I, maybe I'm, you know, maybe I wasn't looking for it enough. I, I, I found what this man went through. He just had layer after layer and to have his best friend being a guy who he probably never really paid any attention to, you know, as one of his serfs or something was, you talk about a, uh, a, a turning of tables. It was remarkable the way uh, Tolstoy writes about it. Yeah, and, and if, you, if you look at the description, at the early descriptions of how he lived and how he wanted to live, it's certainly in contrast to being literally barely almost naked with his feet on the shoulders of the young surf. Mm -hmm. uh, I just had such a vision of him lying on that mm -hmm. 
basically disrobed and with his, with his knees up. And then, and the way he describes this boy, it's like, so he talks about the, the gleaming white teeth of a healthy surf. And it's like, wow, I, that's not the image I would have of a you know, poor peasant, giant, clean, beautiful white teeth. But that's the way he sees them and sees this kindness that he doesn't see in anybody else. And he wants to be petted and he wants to be pitied. And this, this guy yeah, doesn't yeah. even doesn't think twice. He just says what he wants and he does it. You, you know, think he I you think he idealizes Jerusalem? I don't know. He, he becomes the become, saintly figure. He becomes a saintly figure. Mm -hmm. and, and to count Tolstoy's credit, uh, you know, and to answer Mark's question. He, he, he paints a very damning portrait of his milieu, uh, you know, of the czar, czarist reign, of, of all his, the source of his family wealth and power. He absolutely is devastating. And, and to, you know, to answer your question more directly, I, I found it, you know, the French phrase, it's, it's, he was showing how calcified and pretentious it was. And an, another way to look at it is that all these guys, it was just pure... Uh, br bring it back to a little bit of the religion side also, it's, it was all idol worship. Fame, career, money, uh, public perception, all these things. And uh, until the end of the, of the novella, there's zero spirituality. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're, 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 we're brought through very carefully through a complete opposite. <laughs> And in what a damning portrait he has made of his society. Yeah, it's um, it's it, he makes a damning portrait of the society, and also uh, makes a pretty damning portrait of marriage. Uh, so why don't why don't we kind of uh, they're they're sort of all intertwined here, um, but. Uh, you know, so his, uh, let's see, where was the, sorry. Get well, that page 107, he said, says something like this, paraphrase, marriage very early on began to disturb the pleasure and propriety of their life. <laughs> marriage often infringes, infringes both comfort and propriety. Mm. Yeah, and so the one I had, noted here was the beginning of married life with its conjugal caresses, the new furniture, new crockery, and new linen were very pleasant until his wife became pregnant. <laughs> so, you know, so life is supposed to be done easily, pleasantly, decorously. Uh, you know, so this marriage is definitely a real, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, cautionary flashing lights all through this story <laughs> in the career and in the marriage. Uh, does anyone want to point out any of those in regard to it was domestic life? Interesting to me that the whole life uh, the, as seen by both was sort of a stage set. I mean, when he, they go, things went particularly well at first before everything was finally arranged and while something had to still be done. This thing bought, that thing ordered, another thing moved, and something else adjusted. Though there were some disputes between husband and wife, they were both well, so well satisfied and had so much to do uh, that it all passed off without any uh, serious quarrels. But then they get it done, and they have no life together. <laughs> yeah, there's no there there. When, when they start off, uh... It, it said that uh, she fell in love with him, so he decided, well, why not get married? Yeah. But there's no, no question of his loving her. And then he becomes a kind of domestic tyrant. Uh, Ivan Ilyich spent his mornings at the law court and came home to dinner. And at first he was generally in a good humor, though he occasionally be became irritable just on account of his house. Every spot on the tablecloth or the upholstery and every broken window blind string irritated him. He had devoted so much trouble to arranging it all that every disturbance of it distressed him. 
but on the whole, his life ran its course as he believed life should do easily, pleasantly, and decorously. I agree. Well, and I think uh, he, he hates everything that in his wife that really is about him. <laughs> I mean, in the, all the attributes that he that irritate uh, him about his wife are the ones that I see in him writ large. I don't know. Projection. Yeah. You know, I think that um, this whole this whole um, imaginary picture of the perfect life, perfectly led, um, gets gets pierced in the accident. Mm -hmm. And and because he's so self-assured that this is not going to affect it, he goes on and says, oh, you know, being a strong man and I, it, it hurt for a moment, but then it wasn't. So, you know, he just buries this thing that eventually kills him or something like it. I don't know whether it was his the kidney or the appendix or what, whatever it was, but he just puts it aside. Like it's not, it doesn't fit in. An accident doesn't fit into his way of living. Yes. And so he's going to put it aside, yet it's really going to be the be all and end all of his whole existence. Yeah, neither does death fit into his uh, concept of living. No, no, not his, somebody else's maybe. Yeah. There's another, uh, another thing that was said that was, you know, so shocking when you read it is, you know, the idea of about the, their social milieu was in their views as to their acquaintances, they were entirely agreed and tacitly and unanimously kept at arm's length and shook off the various shabby friends and relations. You know, it's just like, it's, it's a, uh, you know, it's a portrait of recess that sort of still seems very much alive. Snobbery at its highest. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, and social climbing, social climbing. Right. So, uh, so let's shift towards that uh, accident as you're as we're doing now. And uh, so, I, I love the uh, I love the first encounter with the doctor, where the doctor summed up uh, brilliantly, looking over his spectacles triumphantly and even gaily at the accused. From the doctor summing up. Ivan Illich concluded that things were bad, but for the doctor, <laughs> and perhaps for everybody else, it was a matter of indifference, though for him it was bad. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a comic tone. Tolstoy's comic tone is just, to me, astoundingly, you know, survives in this, you know, it's very modern, you know. For everyone else, it's fine, but for him, yeah, it's, it's bad. I, I stand corrected. Yeah, yeah. I stand oh, corrected. There were some very funny lines in the in the book. I, I I had forgotten it. I was just overwhelmed with his suffering, you know, and his pain. Oh yeah. And, you know, uh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, nobody gets out of this life alive. All those trite sayings, and you know, the people get buried in shrouds without pockets. So it doesn't really matter, you know, how much you have or how much you accumulated. You can't take any of it with you, and uh, you know, I, I, I just, I just think he's more human than we give him credit for. I mean, yeah. uh, of course, he's a social climber. That's what that's what people did in his society. You know, I mean, it was easy for Tolstoy to be different. You know, he had this huge uh, estate. Uh, this guy, this guy had to play the role that he was given and that he liked, which was being a judge. You know, I mean, if he got up there and acted shabbily, uh, he wouldn't be playing his role. Well, I, 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 Charles, I, I think you hit it right on the head because I, I, one of the beauties of this novella, at, at, for most of it, I think Ivan is treated with almost derision. It's a comic derision. Uh, he's almost left spinning in the wind by Tolstoy, but we're, we're, we're brought eventually to actually sympathize with him. As Absolutely. horrible a person as he was, and all his interactions. Remember, 
you know, everyone's trying to be somewhat nice to him, and he's looking at them with eyes of pure hatred, <laughs> which is his default. Uh, just looking at ev everyone around with pure hatred, and that they're they're hypocrites, and that they 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 don't they don't pity him at all, and that he's demanding pity, but he doesn't like uh, doesn't deserve it for a second. But we still, by the end, feel that there's something about him that reflects our humanity. Why doesn't he deserve pity? I mean, we may not like him, but he's a human being, and he's dying from a terrible disease. He didn't create it. Yeah, you he's know. dying from a terrible disease, and he's alone. This is, this is just a marvelous passage. With this consciousness and with physical pain besides the terror, he must go to bed, often to lie awake the greater part of the night. Next morning, he had to get up again, dress, go to the law courts, speak and write, or if he did not go out, spend at home those 24 hours a day, each of which was torture. And he had to live thus alone on the brink of an abyss with no one who understood or pitied him. Mm -hmm. And that's terrifying. His wife is also blaming him. You brought this on yourself. You're mm -hmm. exaggerating. Nobody can see him except uh, Jerosim. And his son at the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, the son. And that that's then there's a big moment of transformation. But this business of being alone, also the doctors. I mean, I thought, oh, this is what it's like to fall down the rabbit hole, the medical rabbit hole. <laughs> You know, running from doctor to doctor, seeking a different diagnosis. Right. All of the treatment is ineffective, and he's in absolute physical agony, and and then spiritually alone. And no one the really amount of him. the amount of morphine that he was given. Yeah. My God, I can't imagine. Um, there was much a cogent thing going on with him. You know, I, I, I um, the the lack of spirituality. I think that's what the, that he's up. Uh, uh, you know, when he first sees that there's actually an abyss. So I, I think that's that's kind of symbolizing uh, how materialist he is and has no idea of of the spirit. Uh, he demands pity, uh, and yet what comes out is that he's completely egocentric. So that he's really full of self pity. And as his transformation starts getting drawn towards the, the very end, I think yeah. that he, he even says to him, he, he actually says to his son, he, he asks for his son to be removed, you know, so, yeah. he, so he'll stop crying. And he's actually then, he stopped to think of himself only and is starting to think of others. Did, the, did the, the big black bag come before the awareness of the abyss? I can't remember. The black bag? Yeah, the black bag that he kept on falling through. Oh, right. get not, not deep enough. <laughs> no, no. I think that came later than the line quoted there. No. Um, yeah, it kept getting, it kept going further and further uh, yeah, with that. Swollen. Mm. Yeah. So I think you're, you know, one of the things that's really interesting about the, the empathy we feel for Ivan and, and you know Charles, you're really saying you know he's he's a person he's just like us. We should we feel for him, and I think the interesting thing is that Tolstoy creates this character who is so careless about everyone else and so hateful and so uh, you know deserving of everything that comes bad that comes to him in a way, um, you know with the tables turning, you know in so many ways, uh, and and you in some way we feel it's justified, and yet. It, he, he, Tolstoy makes us focus on him as a human, and as a human, it forces us to get past that, uh, you know, the, the idea of, of death as just being something that happens to other people, because he's the one we're going to go through this journey with. And uh, uh, every, every, excuse me. Caius is a man. I'll give you Caius. Caius is a man, and yeah. therefore, and Caius is mortal, therefore, you know, uh, you know, Caius is moral. But so, but when this starts happening, death becomes really real in this whole book. And uh, I felt this is really strong. And 
wonder what others think about how Tolstoy really makes the reader feel the presence of death, even with this character who we might have, you know, mixed feelings about. I, I, you know, I gotta, when I, go, when I get off the, I gotta start looking inside of myself. Maybe I have the wrong values, but I, I just didn't find him as bad as everybody does. I mean, I just found him living, living his life. Uh, he didn't kill anybody. He didn't rape anybody. He didn't molest children. He was a person trying to make it in the world, and it was a rough world to make it in. You know, it was a it was a world of status and stature, and uh, you know, is he a guy that I could ever trust? Is he somebody who I want as a friend? I don't think so, but um, I've known a lot worse. I think, I think from from the, the present day perspective, at Wait, least for me. Um, it seems he's just not an integrated person, and he he he's so compartmentalized that he can't he can't um, he can't see any way from his work to his family to the society. There's no there's no unity. That everything has to be taken one at a time, and that's so unsatisfactory when it comes to a, my idea of a complete human being. There has to be some melding of the values that different parts of your life so that one affects the other, but it doesn't happen. That's what you I know, think the tragedy is. Well, I think in, 80, in now, 81 pages, even Tolstoy is not that much of a genius that he can tell us everything about this guy. Yeah. So I'm sure there were other things. Anyhow, I gotta, well, I, I gotta I really, go. I really am interested in your point of view. Yeah, he's not, a, he's not an arch criminal. Uh, he does, as you say, he doesn't molest children. He hasn't murdered anybody. Uh, however, we have to be interested in Tolstoy's point of view. In other words, Tolstoy is, is really showing us that you can't live your life without being aware that you really are living over an abyss and that the only reality is death. And Tolstoy um, could have taken a great sinner and have him, that would be more Dostoevsky, and I guess, and have that great sinner, you know, realize that he was losing power and that, uh, you know, death is the only reality. But Tolstoy chooses to, to uh, have it, this, this drama enacted in the life of, of an ordinary person who wants to, you see what I mean? And that's more interesting. Well, I think it's banal. This is a banal person. So is he saying, even if you're a banal person, you better wake up? <laughs> well, it's it's really but, 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 but I wonder, I, I wonder if, if death is not a little bit different because it, it seems to me that he sort of came to peace in, in two different ways. That after he had a communion, um, that tended to make him feel more calm, at least temporarily. And as he was going through the various things that he was concerned about, what is what is right and what is not right? Well, anyhow, I, I don't know, ne but never mind. And then as he's getting very close to the end of his life and he's thinking about death and he, he concludes instead of death, there was light. Um, and, and I think maybe that that's perhaps where the religious overtone comes through that there is something after life and that there was a light there somewhere and and that that perhaps made his death less painful to him oh absolutely and it's and i think it's more than an over you know overtone i think it's uh, he, he looks at his wife and he feels sorry for her yeah Jane, can I just say one thing though? I'm not sure the communion helped that much because if I remember, uh, he momentarily and there were all these 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 fluttering moments when he felt like, oh, I'm gonna like make it, uh, and then his wife asks him, "Don't you feel better, honey?" And that starts his three day scream. <laughs> <laughs> so so I'm not sure that that communion was 
was uh, whether it, I would say it's more likely that communion started on the three day scream uh, than than really gave him uh, relief. But but that's just. Well, the, the reason I thought a little bit differently is because after communion, first of all, he, he said that he felt somewhat more at ease. And then he also wanted to live. I want to live. Now, that led to some agony as well. But the want to live somewhat was resolved that instead of death, there was light. Fair enough. I, I thought it was really, maybe that's the next question, that it, uh, Gerasim was really the key to his transformation. Well, I, I think there's definitely, definitely an argument uh, that, you know, Gerasim is kind of a, you know, a Christ figure in the world here, um, in this world. And, and the sense of, Charles, I think of, of this character are that he's born to unbelievable privilege and he's unbelievably insensitive to everyone around him. He, you know, he care, he doesn't care about the people he's serving as a judge. He doesn't care about his family. They're all props and conveniences. And so it's, it's the sin is one of to me, maybe just being superficial and, and deliberately not caring anything more about the life uh so that then sets him up against this very down-to-earth peasant who learned how to talk to gentle folk and uh and uh you know what is his role in this uh and is he a you know am i right in thinking that he's kind of a christ figure in this book Oh, he is. He, he's a saintly, at least a saintly figure, that's for sure. Definitely a saintly figure. I mean, this could be, uh, the, the figure of Gerasim is, is open to lots of criticism. Uh, Gerasim is, is the idealized peasant. He embodies goodness. He feels pity. He's an idealized figure. And uh, in his peasant role, he, he puts uh, Ivan on the commode. He's not afraid of filth and dirt. He says, oh, this is nothing. And um, he's almost like the idealized uh, black person taking care of the master. So we have to ask a lot of questions about that. Uh, yeah, and, and I, I think it was it was Robert who said it's really the most striking image of the novella is is the old, very ill, maybe half naked man with his legs up, up right. on the, the shoulders mm -hmm. of, exactly. of this boy. Exactly. Uh, and, and you know, and, and as you know, Christ like, yes, because that's that's that sounds worse than Christ's washing the feet <laughs> of of uh, he's of, healthy, he has strong arms, yeah. white. He's, he's, he's but, but that, you know. Yeah, but the Gerasim, and, and Tolstoy does, does write about him glowingly. He was the only one who did not lie. Everything he did showed that he alone understood, and this is from Ivan's perspective, of course. Uh, yeah. He alone understood what was happening, saw no need to conceal it, and simply pitied his feeble, wasted master. Uh, and so, so he, he, it's almost the first human connection that Ivan makes in the book. And maybe that's the main one in his life. Yeah, and it's the first mention of pity coming from outside. Yes. It's driving Miss Daisy in Russia. <laughs> <laughs> also There's no Piggly Wiggly in, in, in Russia. <laughs> I also think he's the spokesperson for Tolstoy's view of religion uh, in that, you know, end of the first chapter there where he sums it all up. You know, it's God's will. We shall all come to it someday. We all die. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think he's really in touch with, he seems, you know, it may be idealized and he may be a, you know, mm -hmm. deliberately saintly figure, but he's the one who seen, you know, given that role, he's the one who's understands life and death. He's the one who actually has a religious view 
that is not, you know, putting on airs. Well, I mean, if, if anybody is going to have an understanding of the presence of death, it's going to be a, a, a serf or a peasant who has death around them all the time. I mean, um, I just just everywhere. So he he sees this this person of a different class and a different set of values going through this terrible thing, and he pities him. Remember one thing, Yvonne, I, I think someone listed the number of dead children uh, around yes. him. Yeah. So he was surrounded by death. Yeah. Yet yeah. he still was completely, you know, unattached uh, to it, yeah. uninvolved. <laughs> uh, so w whether or not uh, Jerasim had more encounters with death, we don't know, but he didn't deny it. I think death of children was not that uncommon, but he seemed to have a slew of them. Like he had at least three die, mm -hmm. and only two survived. How unusual is it to avoid thinking of death? I mean, uh, who wants to think of death? It's common. You know, uh, it's coming, but uh, no, no, we I'm don't, sorry. We don't I said want common. to think of it. It's uh -huh. Yeah. Oh, common. Mm -hmm. You yeah. think it's uh, yeah. Avoiding well, death you know, is common. Um, yes, that, that's right. That's, I mean, that's right. That, that agrees with me. I don't know if it's right. <laughs> <laughs> I like this group a lot. I have to tell you, this is uh, it, the good thing in our choice of books. By the way, is the next one won't be deep, deep philosoph uh, philosophical. It's about Jewish mobsters. I, I, I can't imagine, you know, but they were good to their mothers. <laughs> don't, you know? don't, don't sell them short. You don't know. Hey, listen, if they're Jewish, they're not be philosophical, right? <laughs> so before we, we go, I just wanted to say I have a slide. Wait, 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 wait. I, my oh. question yeah. and is yeah. that I didn't understand the ending. Yeah, yeah. Um, I get to the so, end. So go ahead, Darian. Is because you said before we go, and I didn't want to. No, that's what I was going to go. draw attention to the ending. I want to discuss it, so I didn't want to slight that. So please jump in. Well, it didn't seem to. I I wasn't clear on the ending. It didn't seem like he was sorry for his life in a way. Like he looked at it, and it seemed to me like he said, "I did everything like I was supposed to do." And I, I got so confused when he said that. I wanted to see him transform to something else. And Miriam said she saw this transformation. I was a little confused. Well, he, he was sorry for his life. That was happening all, all along when he begins to question it in the face of death. But in, in, he gets beyond that. He gets beyond despairing that he hasn't led the authentic virtuous life and he looks at his wife and he feels sorry for her in other words the moment of self-forgetfulness is a kind of redemption because then it's not about him anymore it's about others he See, thought, i thought the son was his redemption and then the son he said i felt sorry for her too and then he touches the the uh just then his schoolboy son had crept softly in and gone up to the bedside. His hand fell on the boy's head and the boy caught it, pressed it to his lips and began to cry. So aside from Jerasim, this is the only touch, real tender human touch that he, he's had. Mm -hmm. And it changes him. <sighs> And he, 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 he tried to add, forgive me, but said, forgo and waved his hand, knowing that he whose understanding mattered would understand. Well, that's, you notice that he is capitalized. So he's referring to God. Do everybody see that? He with a yeah. capital letter. Okay. And Doreen, my, my reading of the end there was that by the end, he realized his life had been completely empty that he, he may have done all the proper things that in, in from his perspective or what society demanded or what he thought were, were the things that were you're supposed to do to get ahead, all those things. 
and after the three day scream, uh, he came to the realization that it really was all for not until then, N-A-U-G-H-T, uh, and that he then accepts a spiritual life, to, to put it that way. Uh, and that's his redemption. So it's, it's, it's worth, yeah. And it doesn't matter if his life is a failure. You reach okay. a point where you, you're beyond that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. Well, it I matter. think- Whose life is, is uh, everything is as it should be. No one, unless you're completely self-deluding. But then you get beyond that somehow and you realize that you're not that important. And then the, the feeling for others and the ability to ask for forgiveness. And then he refers to, he, he's, you know, he's talking about God here. Capital, you know, capital, capitalized. And that's a big switch. That doesn't happen before anywhere. I don't think so. No, no. Well, hey, you were going to say something. I think something kind of interesting about his life, though, that that he again he saw light, and we were talking about perhaps somewhat as a somewhat of a Christ figure that he saw light, and it was revealed to him that his life had not been what it ought, but he could still rectify, mm, and the way he could rectify is by dying and not continuing to tor uh, torture his family. Uh, so there was a reason to pass, mm -hmm. uh, which was part of the reason for his life, which is kind of strange. But so what I found a little bit confusing was that he seems to make peace with death, but not with life. Well, and he's dying. He, so death is finished, he said to himself. It is no more. Well, the death and finish is finished. Then there's this this hope of death is not the enemy anymore. Yeah, I think you're right because that's where again it comes out and says instead of death, there was light. Yeah. There was no death. There was no fear because there was no death. In place of death, there was light. Well, that's a very Christian concept. Absolutely. Yeah, and he also says, "What a joy." Yeah. Right. So I see this as a two-stage conversion uh, here. So in the penultimate chapter, he has this moment where he realizes the truth. And he saw himself and all for which he lived. He saw clearly that it was not real at all, but a terrible and huge deception, which had hidden both life and death. And then that made him feel even worse, but then the priest comes in, which is another interesting thing to me as far as the the role of religion, because it does, in that moment of where he suddenly realizes that he's dying and he's lived a complete life of, you know, falsity, that's when the priest comes in and calms things down and he finds a ray of hope. Uh, but then he has to realize that that this is the, fa the the fact that he's dying and he's lived this false life and he doesn't know how to rectify things. So then the second stage of it is uh, at the end when he realizes, uh, you know, what is the right thing and it is to be able to see others and not just to see his own suffering to, and to be wrapped up in his own suffering and his own torture, but to realize that he is in fact causing suffering and torture for his family. And I don't know if he loves them, but he finally recognizes them as people who he can do something for, which is to feel sorry for them and to stop them from suffering as much as is within his power uh, and to forgive them or to forego. Um, you know, so I think there is this kind of a, the, the 
the conversion is kind of a stage. It's, it's, there's layers to it there. And uh, so, I mean, I don't know. Your question was about which specific line, Doreen? It wasn't about a specific line. I just. Just the ending in general. It was, I don't know. Maybe this is a very American concept to try and like make peace with life. And I found like he was making peace with death but he never really made peace with life. Um, Even the way he treated his family. I, I just end. felt like this kind of weird, uh, I, I just felt this weird kind of uh, like unsettled feeling. Maybe I need to read it more carefully. Maybe I was tired when I read it. I don't know. Um, um, and I read this book at the same time, I, I teach English to a Russian student for the first time. And um, we had earlier read Tuesdays with Maury. And I don't know if anyone's read that book by Mitch Album. Mm -hmm. It's about a, a guy who every Tuesday visits his old English teacher and they talk about the meaning of life. And it's completely different in how it approaches the subject of death with Maury like looking out the window at the tree. <laughs> and talking about how beautiful life is and you know how beautiful the tree is and admiring the leaf on it and the passage of the clouds and you know gathering his family around and his loved ones and having this very positive you know isn't life fabulous sort of attitude and she brought it up all of a sudden when we were discussing this book and she's like it's the complete opposite. And I'm like, do you think that's somehow reflective of Russian and US culture? And she said, I think so. And then I realized, well, maybe I was looking at this book from a very American point of view, like wanting to him to be at peace with life. And I didn't feel like he was like in the end, he, he says, I couldn't have lived life any differently. That's, that's what I got out of it. And well, so I was very confused. I mean, I see it differently now from what Miriam has said and others have said, but. Hey, Maury, Maury had better drugs. <laughs> <laughs> well, Maury, Maury wrote, wrote his own book, uh, which was a different tone than, than uh, Albom's book. It, it, Maury Schwartz, I think his name was, is, was. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that I thought that uh, Tuesdays with we don't we're not talking about that book, but I thought that was exploitive, the way he wrote it, uh, and uh, it, at any rate, if you get a chance, and if you don't, if you can't, the next time we get together, God willing, as human beings in a room together, I'll bring the book by uh, by Maury, and read his book. It's it's so much better than Mitch's book. It didn't sell. Uh, nobody particularly read it, but it it really dealt more. You, you'll get a sense of who Maury was and not who Mitch, who hadn't seen him for 20 years, decided this would be a good book to write. I, so, I, you know, I can to, be cynical, I, too. Yeah. I, just wanted to, I wanted to point out the, the extent of the transformation. Uh, you know, the second to last page, he looked at her. He's looking at his wife. She gazed at him with an open mouth, mm -hmm. with unwiped tears on her nose and cheeks, with a look of despair on her face. The wife is sounding a little better all of a sudden. He grieved for her. I mean, that is so odd. How many times did he say he hated her guts? She touched him. She kissed him mm -hmm. falsely, and he, he just was exploding with hatred for her. <laughs> Uh, so by the end, and I don't know if this helps Doreen, but by the end, he's transformed. So it's not that he, you know, life was beautiful. It wasn't. For him, it was awful. But at least he came to a spiritual truth and to a light. And when it says all this happened in a single moment, but the significance of that moment was lasting, that's, that's kind of like hinting towards eternal life, you know. So it is, this is a very Christian perspective. Uh, and that this guy... It doesn't matter, you know, if, if you had killed tons of people beforehand, how, how awful a sinner he was, by, by the, the end of the book, uh, he's transformed. Yeah. And, and, you know, from a Christian perspective, uh, as long as you make an act of repentance at the end, your soul will be saved. 
And also from a Christian perspective, despair is a sin. Despair is a sin. And also despair from a Christian is sin? Hmm? Despair, despair is yeah, sin? Because, yeah, despair, you, uh, in a way, you don't believe anymore. You don't look to God. And uh, he, he stops despairing. He stops. And he exclaims at the end, what joy. That he says, what joy. Mm. So he's in from a Christian perspective, he is saved. Yeah. And I'll add one other note from a Christian perspective, which is it the death of his old self at the time of the priest's confession. Mm. Uh, and then there's this three-day period where he goes into this cave of, you know, uh, of 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 you know, just yelling and screaming constantly for three days, it's sort of, you know, Christ going after death, going into the cave, and three days later, the spirit rises. So there's, I think, a deliberate selection of the idea of three days, and then this, you know, rapture, moment of rapture. Because right. it's very, you know, all the, all those things would be very, very apparent to to all the readers and to Tolstoy. If I, but it is a, it's buried in this, you know, context, you know, we don't think in these, you know, kind of terms, but it was a very heavy, you know, society that Tolstoy was writing in. So it's a different book from Tuesday's <laughs> morning. Said she didn't feel like he was ashamed of his life. Ashamed of what? He passed it. He was, and then he got past that. Yeah, he, he did reject his life. He did come to, you said that he would have lived his life the same way again. And there was a point where he was saying, how could he have lived it yeah. differently? But by the end, I think he, he, by the time of the confession, he realized that he's fooling himself. Okay, and, I have to reread the end. But yeah, not just the 12th chapter, but the, uh, the 11th chapter as well. That's where I think he has that transformation. And leading up to it, it's kind of building. It was building for a little bit there. Don't you think that most, many, if not most people, feel that upon approaching death, you know, as they think back? I mean, fortunately, I'm not there. Uh, but everybody has regrets. You know, um, I, I think everybody would have done something differently. Um, I know have, have, having been with good friends of mine in their last days, you know, that, that it's, I don't think it's that uncommon that people look back on their life with great regret. No, deathbed conversion is a term of art, isn't it? Yep. You know, I, I just wanted to add to pull back a little bit to Tolstoy's life, what little I know of it. Uh, it, it, it sounds it, this book was the end of what a 10 year complete spiritual crisis in his life. Uh, and, and so by writing through this, there's some kind of transformation that occurred to him. Now he seemed to, he went on a rather eccentric path by giving up all material possessions almost from, from the sound of it and responsibilities. Um, but but I just want to, you know, it, it, again, the bio that I have says that, that Tolstoy was into the moral perfectibility of man. Well, that sounds kind of humanistic, materialistic, that man, if he works hard enough, can make himself great. And that, and that leads to a spiritual crisis and denial of death. Because if, if you can perfect yourself, then, you know, then heck. What's, there's no original sin. We're not decaying. Yeah, I don't know if I'm making any sense, but it's it's it 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 kind of tied together for me that Tolstoy went through a ten-year spiritual crisis, uh, and and he still held on to the moral perfectibility of man, which is actually a very modern kind of thought. Um, I I don't personally believe in that. Um, but that he he seemed to have written his way through or past it. With this book it's something that might be interesting as we pick out books maybe we should take pick out the confession which was written by tolstoy which apparently was written parallel with this book and it's one where that one is not maybe autobiographical it is biographical mm -hmm. 
Um, and, and it probably be interesting to see how confession ties in with the death of. Um, th there may be lots and lots of parallels in those two. Great idea, Jamin. But well, we don't make the executive decisions here, but suggest it next time. And then you get to lead the group in that discussion if it gets voted in. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, I feel like we've given this uh, little 80 page book a good uh, ringing through at this point. And yeah, that was the hope is that uh, having something short, we could accomplish it with the little time we had. All right. A lot of folks joined in and this is a rich discussion. So uh, does anyone have any parting thoughts? Because uh, I feel like we sort of have gone through it now. I think Happy Hanukkah, it's a perfect Merry place. Christmas, and all good holidays. Yeah. And, a, and a better 2021 Thank you. for everybody. Yeah. And I, I just want to say, I, I find it an amazingly modern novella. And I'll, I'll leave it at that, that, that's, that somehow he was able to pull this off uh, what, 140 years ago or so. Uh, and so I, I'm deeply in, in admiration. Uh, so, and I'm also, I'm looking forward to, to next uh, book, which is gonna be quite a change of pace. Uh, bring it right back to New York and, and the mob. A different kind of societal look. <laughs> Maybe not that different, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but um, remember that I, we I have one thing. Yeah. We are, we are right. doing that the second Friday, so I just want to remind you. So we're giving us now ourselves four weeks, uh, and we'll push that into, the, I think it's January 8th, uh, that book. So you'll, you'll, you'll be getting the info. Um, I, I, I had sort of a parting thought, going back to maybe the initial conversation of how important is it to try to understand the author. Um, I read a book, which I don't recommend. It's called The, the Night Portrait. Um, and the, the thing that's interesting about the night portrait is that it goes into the painting of Cecilia by Leonardo da Vinci. And um, probably for those who've seen Cecilia, we thought, well, that's a nice painting. But if you didn't go into what the history of Cecilia was all about, you really couldn't appreciate Cecilia and what Leonardo da Vinci was doing. So I think sometimes maybe it's a little bit arduous and it's not to deny the artistry itself, but probably lots of times the medium is the message and you need to figure out where the author is coming from to see what his message is. Um, and, and at least I've, I felt that to be interesting in, in trying to understand this book as well. Uh, it, I just it, have one it, it question if I may. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Jay. Do you have to make peace with life to make peace with death? I'm sorry? Do you have to make peace with life to make peace with death? It seems to me like that was what was bugging me. And everybody said it doesn't matter, right? Like, oh, he made peace with death and he had this transformation. Is that the same thing? But I think it was peace with life. It's think, almost, it was like only at the very end, but he, he came to a peace with, with life. Okay. I think that's the idea of, of have, dying with a clean conscience. You know, the idea that uh, you, you're, you've, you're leaving the world having, as, as his friend says at the end, having lived and accomplished rightly. You know, his friend sees him there in the casket and thinks that he's lived life correctly. Mm -hmm. And having gone through this with him, we see that he felt, he, that Ivan felt t just the opposite, that he had not lived life correctly, but that by the end, he had reconciled himself to what his attitudes and should be. And so he died with a clean conscience, having reconciled that. Uh, and, and that made him look to his friend, that's all that is, you know, not at all seen. He just thinks he lived rightly because he was one of his social class and he was a judge and he died and that was it, you know. But I do think the making peace is part of the message of the book and is, is probably a good one. The, the idea of hell is dying with something bad on your conscience, right? Uh, you know, just one, one little teeny weeny last thought for me. Um, as a devotee of Dickens, I kept thinking 
this story could have been a subplot in a zillion long <laughs> Dickens novels. I mean, it could have been, you know, uh, Jarndyce versus Jarndyce, right, fits right into it with all the judges involved. Mm -hmm. But it could have been, it could have been an amazing sort of thing for him to include. Yeah, well, he usually writes these epics, right? And I haven't read any of them, but I'm going to now because I'm so impressed with what I just saw in this one. But this was very spare. Yeah. It's like he cut out everything and he didn't even comment on a lot of what he did say. So it's like he cut out everything in order to isolate this, this, this process, this journey, and it's, it was very rewarding for that. Yeah. But I would like to see the epics now that I've seen yeah. the, the, the distilled jewel of that. And I'll just add, there's, there's one thing from chapter one, and it's Pietor uh, uh, recognizing this. He's taking a look at the dead Ivan, and he says, uh, his face had acquired an expression of greater beauty, above all of greater significance than it had in life. Mm. So again, there's like, things breaking through even to this very kind of shallow Peter I Ivanovich. You know, he, he had a breakthrough in an emotion as, as uh, Mark mentioned in the, in the first chapter, where he also recognized that there was a transformation in his sort of friend. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, guys, we're pushing towards two hours here. So I, I feel like we should say happy Hanukkah, happy Christmas. <laughs> Absolutely. And a great new year. Happy great. new year to everybody. Be well. See you next time. Take care. Miriam, Stay look well. forward to seeing you in Miami, Miriam. Oh, yeah, I, I am too. It and stay warm, Miriam. And Thank safe well. journey, Mark. Bye. Safe Bye. journey. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. And thanks Bye. for terrific uh, questions and leading. Much, much appreciated. See you guys. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>